Okay, so in the last lecture, we'll talk about three ways to write the same model. The first way is the LMM. It includes the fixed part, the random effects, and the measurement error. And we have an assumption on the join distribution of random errors together with random effects. And we assume there's no, in, no correlation between the random errors and the random effects. The second way is what we call a hierarchical linear model. We write a model in two layers or two levels. In the first level, we assume that given conditional on the random effects, this is the distribution of our observations. And the second level is about the distribution of the random effects. So in our motivating example, in our earlier discussion, we see that delta involves the effects that are specific to groups and because we have many groups and not so many observations within each group, we assume those group specific parameters delta to be random. So that's why we are going to handle the, um, the differences in the groups, in the, in the group specific parameters. So essentially the beta, the fixed effects captures the common effects for all groups while delta captures the group specific variation from the common effect. The third way is just aggregate the two random parts. Okay, so epsilon star is a combination of the Z delta and epsilon. So by this definition, clearly the variance covariance matrix of epsilon star has this form and we call this matrix V. So this is the matrix, the combined variance that includes both the variance contributed by the random effect as well as the, ran, the variance contributed by random error, measurement error, okay? So in the special case of random intercept model, this is the form of this variance epsilon star. So it will be a block diagonal matrix within each block on the diagonal, we always have omega square plus sigma square. That's the variance of each observation, okay? Each yij. And for yij is the jth observation in group i, just as a re reminder. And omega square is just the covariance of observations within the same group, like yij and yij prime. Their covariance is omega square. And for observations in different groups, let's say yij and yi prime j, there's no covariance, so there are zeros. So this formulation allows us to capture dependence within each group. But basically we are assuming that, okay, observations within one group are more similar to each other. Then we, if we want to talk, if we want to talk about parameter estimation, we may think of it in two ways. The key parameter is the beta, the fixed effect, right? And we also have variance related parameters like the V in model three or G and R. Here is the G and R, the G and R. For G is the covariance matrix of the random effects and R is the covariance matrix of the random error. So these things are also parameters we need to estimate in our model. Or if we're under this random intercept model, we just need to estimate omega square for G and sigma square for R. So that simplifies our parameters a lot. And for the random effect itself, like the delta, we although it's assumed to be random, but still we can talk about its posterior mean. That is, we are interested in knowing delta has a prior which we specify, right? This is the prior of delta, or this is it. Delta has a normal prior. But under the Bayesian framework, what we're interested in is what's the distribution of delta given our data, or what we call it as the posterior. So therefore, Given the posterior distribution, which we can derive, we can talk about the expectation of delta given y. That is, what is the expected random effect of each group given our data? Because this expectation clearly will involve 
unknown parameters. So we are going to talk about estimated post-learning, where the unknown parameters are going to be replaced by our est parameter estimates. So that's why this is, we are exactly under the empirical base framework. The reason is that the prior parameter that we don't know, G, is going to be estimated from data. So that's why we say this is an empirical base. Okay, so last time we started our discussion by focusing on the simple and ideal case where the, the variance matrix, the covariance matrices G and R are known. So given that we only have beta unknown and we're also interested in the posterior mean of delta. So now model three is very helpful because model three is basically a linear model, except that the random errors no longer are IID with common variance sigma squared. So in other words, we just generalize linear model by allowing this random error vector to have a complicated covariance matrix V as this. But we know that despite that, we can still do MLE. So we can still use the fact that Y is jointly is following normal distribution with mean x beta and covariance matrix as v. So if we write that down, then we can have a likelihood function of beta. Okay, and that likelihood function only involves x, y, and what v, the covariance matrix, because this is known. Given G and R are known, V is known. So we can directly derive the MLE beta hat as this. So it's essentially the weighted least square formula. Okay, how about the distribution, the posterior distribution of delta given Y? So to do that, we're going to use model two to write down the joint distribution of Y and delta like this. And then we can just take a nice property of Gaussian. That is, if we take delta and conditional on Y, it is still Gaussian and we have a formula for that. So essentially model two, the hierarchical linear model allows us to write down a joint distribution of Y and delta. And our model one, the linear mixed FA model allows us to easily derive the covariance between Y and delta which is what we need for the off-diagonal entry in the covariance matrix between Y and Delta here. Okay, so finally, after we derive the posterior mean, which takes this form, you see it involves unknown parameter beta. Then we plug in beta using the beta hat MLE. And this is what we call the empirical. So then this thing, delta hat is what we call empirical base best linear unbiased predictor, short as E blob. Okay, so anyway, so sometimes we look at, we do look at the delta hat defined in this way because we want to examine how the group specific parameters are estimated. So we are going to look at say, the delta may involve the group specific intercepts as in our random intercept model. So that can give us some idea about, okay, how different the groups are. But ultimately, if you really want to know whether the groups are different or not, you are going to test variance, okay? So we're going to talk about that probably in our next lecture. It's about whether, whether you want to test the variance here. So in the random intercept model, omega square captures the variance of group specific intercepts. So by testing beta zero, beta square equal to zero, you can essentially answer the question, are the groups really different? Do I really need to incorporate a random intercept? If not, then probably you, you can just get rid of this group specific intercept by just including the fixed effect only. That is by assuming your groups have the same intercept, then that can simplify your model. Yeah. Okay. So, but for now, let's continue our discussion about the esti parameter estimation. Okay, so in the notes, we have more discussion, but I'm going to 
I'm not, I'm just not going to talk about it here and not more discussion about, okay, whether you could regard the, you could regard this, um, join, you can use the join distribution of Y and Delta, okay, which is what we already have. Yeah, Y and Delta. Can you simply write, use this distribution to write down the likelihood by considering both beta and delta as parameters in that likelihood. And then can you just directly do, do, do MLE for both beta and delta together to find the MLE estimates instead of going this, this two step. Okay, first you get MLE of beta hat by ignoring delta because using the model three, because in model three, if you recall, there's no delta anymore, just the beta and the random term. And then what we did is that we used the post theorem. I prefer this way because I think it's better or clearer in distinguishing that beta is considered to be fixed while delta is considered to be random. So I like this way. But in the notes, we also have that second way by treating both beta and delta as parameters in a likelihood. The likelihood is just written as the joint probability of our data y delta given prime, uh, y and delta. Yeah, so then you can do MLE and you can solve that. And essentially you can show that this solution, okay, this beta hat MLE of this form and delta hat of this form, they can actually jointly solve that likelihood derivative equal to zero equation. So you will see that you'll get a consistent answer. But I think that's just some technical thing to know about. So I'm not going to spend time talking about that right now. So if you're interested, please check the notes, le lecture notes 15. Okay, so now let's move on to talk about the realistic case when the G and R are unknown. Okay, so I'm going to write that estimate beta and still the posterior mean of delta with unknown G and R. And of course, then V is unknown. It's also unknown. So we need to estimate those variance terms. Okay, so before I talk about that, there's one thing I need to motivate you to think of the problem. The first is in this example, it's an example we all learn in the introductory mathematic statistic class. So here is the case. So let's assume that we have IID Y1 to YN. They are an independent sample, scalar value real valued from a normal distribution with mean mu variance sigma squared, right? Then how do we estimate mu? How do we estimate sigma squared? So clearly, if we use the likelihood approach, the likelihood, let's write L mu sigma squared, okay? It will take this form, that is, the density product of the density of yi given mu and sigma square, right? We know this and then use the normal distribution This is what we have Okay and then you can see that if we take the log likelihood, what do we have? The log likelihood So I'm going to ignore the density like the two pi those things. So then you will see that the log likelihood is essentially negative n over 2 log sigma squared, that will be the first term, minus um, two sigma squared inverse summation i from one to n. 
y i minus mu square. Okay, so that will be the log likelihood to maximize. And what's interesting here is that you can see if we find the MLE, then we for the MLE of mu hat, the MLE mu hat, we will find that it's just equal to one over n yi. And to find this solution, you can basically cancel out sigma square in your derivative because you're going to set a derivative equal to zero. And then when you take the derivative again, partial derivative against mu, sigma square in the first term is gone. In the second step, when you take that derivative set it to zero, sigma square can be canceled. So therefore your MLE has nothing to do with sigma square. In other words, no matter how large the variance is, your MLE for the mean will stay as the average of y1 to ym. How about sigma square? Let's take a look. So if we want to do the sigma square, then there is an issue, okay? Partial log likelihood partial sigma square. I'm taking sigma square as a whole parameter. Okay, so then you see what would I have in the first term? Negative two sigma square over n, that's the first term. In the second term, what, it, what will it be? It will be plus two sigma fourth because sigma square is treated as one parameter, one, so basically I'm doing the derivative of one over sigma squared. So that gave me uh, minus one over sigma four. And the sum yi minus mu squared. Okay, so if I set this equal to zero, okay, setting this to zero, if I set this to zero, you see, the solution I would obtain is actually sigma square hat equals what? One over n summation, I go from one to n, yi minus mu square. So in other words, the MLE of sigma square involves the unknown mu, the parameter mean is getting involved, okay? And what's wrong with this? We don't know this. So that's why essentially what we do is that we are plugging the MLE mu hat to replace this mu to obtain our sigma hat MLE. Okay, so we, are, we need to be aware of this. So with the plugging, we get one over N y i minus mu i hat mld squared. This becomes a realistic estimator. But this plugin has its rationale. This is by essentially using, this is what we call the profile likelihood approach. This is something we mentioned before, earlier in our class. So what does it mean? It means that we first obtain the maximizer for the parameter that are easy to estimate. Clearly that's mu. So we can easily find the mu MLD first. And it means that no matter which sigma square value is, we should always find, use the mu value as the mu hat MLD to maximize the likelihood. So this holds for all sigma square. And then given that we could just by using mu hat MLE instead of mu in our likelihood so that we are only left with one known unknown parameter sigma squared. So the proof of likelihood is just L mu hat MLE sigma squared. So mu is gone and we're left with just sigma squared. And to maximize this using this approach, we're going to get a sigma squared MLE in this way, okay? So this is what we are familiar with. In short, the profile likelihood will give you the MLE. Then there's no issue with that. 
But an issue with this is something we already know. That is, sigma square hat MLE is biased, right? It is biased. So what is the bias? The bias is due to the denominator M. And we know that what should be unbiased is M minus one. And we can actually show this by um, checking the bias of this, right? We can show that, okay, expectation of sigma square had MLD divided by sigma square. We can show that it is that expectation is less than one. It's just M minus one over M. Sigma had MLD is M minus one over M times sigma square. So there is a downward bias. We tend to estimate the variance to be smaller than they should be. Okay, so then what's our solution at minus one? But how can we get a solution except this approach, right? This approach is obvious, showing that they differ by this factor. We just divide this by M minus one and multiply by M, we're done. Another approach is to think of our data, okay? So here the data are what? Y1 to Yn, they follow the same mean. Think of another way to, of this problem. That is, if we take Y1, my y1 minus my two, y1 minus y2, y2 one minus y3, and y yn minus one minus yn. So if you think of it as this, then, or probably this is not very good. No. I prefer not to use this way, because there's some complication involved. Okay, so let me think of another way. So how about let's do y1 minus y bar, y2 minus y bar, and yn minus y bar. Let me think. Okay, probably I am not going to talk about it in this way. So there's a little trick here. So I, I think the original idea, what I wrote here is much better. So what I mean is that, so probably I'll just stick with the old one. So let's say y2 minus y1, y3 minus y2, okay? And yn minus yn minus one. So by doing this sequential subtraction, essentially each of them are going to have mean zero. Okay, that's the key because they share the same mean. So by taking the difference, each one, the, each difference has mean zero, that's what we know. And how about the variance? The variance of each one is actually y2 minus y1, two sigma squared, okay? I'm just going to say it this way. But here, the reason I delete this is because I realized there is some dependence between those two because say Y2 is involved in both. But let's just pretend that we ignore that. So basically what I wanna say is that if you use data in this way, okay? And then if you show now the mean is gone, you only have, you're only left with one variance parameter. Then you don't have this issue, which is about the mean getting involved in the variance formula, so that the MLD involves the mu hat MLD and that caused the bias. So essentially, the bias is caused by the fact that you use the same data for twice. It's used to for the mean estimation and you use in the variance estimation for twice. So basically, we know that it's called the degree of freedom n minus one. What we mean is that we only have n minus one degree of freedom instead of n degree of freedom. Because if you think of mu as known, here we do have n degrees of freedom. Y1 and Yn can vary freely. 
But now we use the mean estimation estimator for the as the average of y1 to yn. We basically restrict y1 to yn by fix their average. So we lose one degree of freedom. So we're left with n minus one degree of freedom. So this approach, okay, is what we call the restricted data. Okay, this is the restricted data. And please be aware that there is some covariance between two adjacent terms, but that's fine. But even given that, we can still write down the joint likelihood, that joint density as the likelihood of sigma square. Okay, you can try that yourself. This is fine. And then you can show that the using this approach, the sigma square hat, we call this restricted ML, okay? Restricted maximum likelihood. This will just become one over N minus one. Y I minus Y bar square. So this is something you can show yourself. So what I want to say is that this example motivated us to think about the variance estimation in our linear mixed effect model because the issue is similar to estimate G and R or V, which is, these are the variances. We also have the unknown parameter beta getting involved. So essentially, if we do MLE, just like in this case, do MLE, we estimate beta hat MLE, which should always be like this. Although here the V is unknown, we can carry it over. So basically we can say, okay, beta hat MLE is a function of V. We put it back into the log likelihood, likelihood to obtain the profile likelihood. Back here, Jim. There's typo. Profile likelihood should use the capital L. It's the likelihood, not the log likelihood. Yeah. So then we can find the V, right? Based on the profile likelihood. Very similar here. But again, that MLE of V will involve the beta hat MLE. So essentially, you lost degrees of freedom when you use the MLE estimator. Instead of, instead, if you use the restricted ML estimator, the restricted maximum likelihood estimator, you can get rid of the bias. So that's why in the linear mixed effect model, you will see in the R package LME4, which you are going to use for your homework, you can actually see that, yes, there is a very big difference between, so there is a difference between what we call REML and what we call ML. And the R package actually give you option for both. The difference is essentially in how you are going to estimate the variance terms, whether you're going to use the NLD found by profile likelihood or whether you're going to use the REML by ignoring or by removing the mean parameters first. So you're only left with the variance parameter, just like we did here. So here, this is a simple technique approach to get rid of the mean. So we only left with the variance to estimate. But in our LMM, we cannot so easily get rid of the beta. So we have to really use integration by getting rid of beta. So we are only left with the variance terms. Okay, so I hope this example makes sense to you. And then we're going to come back to our LMM discussion. Do you have question about this part? Uh, professor? Yeah. Um, what's the difference between this REML uh, parameter and like the unbiased estimator that we- It's exactly derived? the same. Okay. It's, it's the same. It's just that in our previous discussion for correcting the bias, we just directly go into the case to say, okay, we, we calculate the bias and we correct the estimator accordingly. But here we're giving you a different approach. We're saying that if you can invent a way to get the, to get your model not dependent on the mean parameter. So you're only left with the variance parameter and then you are getting the so-called the marginal likelihood, essentially it's the marginal likelihood of the sigma square and maximizing that marginal likelihood, we call the estimator, the REML estimator. That's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. All right, so now, 
let's come back to the LMM question. So we assume that in the, the variance terms are just depending on a variance parameter. Theta, okay? So for example, we can think of theta just as our sigma square and omega square in the random intercept model, okay? So with this, then we write, so given this variance parameter, we can write that covariance matrix for the random effects, the G as G theta. The error, the covariance matrix for the random errors R as R theta and V theta. So all those matrices can be just specified given theta. Okay. And then you see the model just rely on two parameters, beta and theta, and we're done. So like the three, the third way of writing the model, if you recall, it is y equals x beta plus epsilon star. So now you see, we can say that epsilon star follows, uh, this is capital M by one for the notation for a rem reminder, multivariate normal distribution with covariance matrix V theta. And that's it. This is our model. So then we know that in terms of the uh, log likelihood of Gaussian. So this is going to, to write that down. So the likelihood of beta and theta is going to depend on the joint density of Y and Y is capital M by one, okay? So essentially we can show that this can be specified by that capital N dimensional Gaussian density. And we know that for, okay? So it's actually equal to one over the determinant of the covariance matrix V theta, V delta one half inverse times the exponential function of negative y minus x beta transpose times the inverse of the covariance matrix of the error term times y minus x beta. Okay, this is just a vector notation for the multivariate normal density. I ignore that constant one over square root of two pi to the power of capital M. And please know that in, if you think of this, this determinant, if it is a diagonal matrix, then it's just multiplying all the diagonal elements together, right? So let's say if V sigma is in our simple, it's in our linear model where it's sigma square along the diagonal, then it could be just sigma square to the power capital M. So you have the sample size you have the number of observations involved here. So you don't need to have the number of observations outside because V theta is an N by N matrix, just for your information. Okay, so then the log likelihood, right? This is just equal to some constant, I'm going to ignore, minus one half log determinant and minus, okay, I'm going to put that together, minus one half, and there is, oh, sorry, I forgot, there is a one half here, I forgot this. Okay, so I have minus one half, minus one half in two terms, then this is changed to plus because the negative sign is out, y minus x beta transpose v theta inverse y minus x beta. Okay, that's the log likelihood, and we're going to maximize it. So now again, you see the given theta, 
using that profile likelihood approach, then clearly we see beta hat ML MLE is equal to just by taking this part. Okay, so to really see the point, you need to have some matrix calculus knowledge to be able to do that. So probably I'll just go to go one step for your information, just in case some of you are not so familiar with this. Okay, so what I need is that I need to take the partial derivative against beta. Beta itself is a P by one vector. And I know that this is a scalar, okay? I do the transpose matrix vector, vector transpose that matrix vector, this is a scalar. So I'm taking a scalar against a vector parameter. And so basically, based on, depending on different textbook have different definition, but here the way we're going to use is that we're going to take this as well, call it to a gradient as a column vector. And that gradient is going to be of the same dimension as beta. So that's a P, beta is P dimensional. So this partial derivative against beta is going to be P dimensional. And we can see that basically just similar to our say, you can consider this to be like the square, right? You have transpose times itself as a square and there's a constant in the middle. So therefore we're going to get a two out of it and we're going to keep the constant but get rid of one copy. So therefore the gradient would just be equal to two times, let me just say this, partial this partial beta, okay? It's going to be two times V theta inverse times Y minus X beta, okay? So, and we are going to have, this is by the chain rule, we first get this. And then we are going to do that against beta further. Okay, so don't forget that. And then we're going to get a negative x out. That's it. So that's why we're going to, that's the gradient against beta. And we are going to do that. And finally, we are going to have set this to zero to solve for the beta. So ultimately, we are going to see that this is equal to what we have seen before. X transpose V theta inverse X trend X inverse times X transpose V theta inverse Y. Okay, so we are going to have that in our result. Let me see if I miss something. Yeah, I think I missed something in the chain rule. Just give me one second. I think I'm correct here. Two times this. This is a matrix for that. And I think it's about the chain rule for the matrix calculus. Mm, I think then, there should be some term related to X, V, inverse, and Y, at least. So X, Y is here. V inverse is here. I think it's about the last step. So how I'm going to get this derivative for beta? Negative X. Because here we, we clearly have some dimension issue. This is n by n, and this is n by one. And negative x is n by p. 
So we need something, we need a one, we need a P by one matrix. Yeah, I think it's just, I think it's the issue with the chain rule. I think what we need, it should be, okay. Based on the dimension, I think it should be this. It should be two negative two times X transpose times V theta inverse times one minus X beta. I think that's what we need. Yeah, and so this dimension is correct. P by N, N by N, N by one, and set this to zero to solve for the, to solve for the beta. Yeah, and I think that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so that's the MLE for beta. And it clearly you see it involves theta. So I'm going to put theta here. So we are doing the profile likelihood by conditioning on theta. And for every theta, that's the beta value to maximize the likelihood. And then the profile likelihood of theta is, we call it ALP. P stands for profile theta. It's just the likelihood with beta replaced by beta hat MLE theta and theta. So you see the only unknown parameter is theta and we want to maximize that. So then you just plug this into the model and then you solve for what's the theta, that's it. Okay, so the maximizer of that is what we're going to call as theta ML. I, I left out the E just to be a little more consistent with the REML because that there we don't see REMLE. So here I intentionally left out the E word, the E letter. So theta ML is the R max of LP theta, the profile likelihood. That's it. But just for the same reason, about that simple example. Here, this RML or this theta hat ML is known to have a downward bias. The reason is that you are essentially using a degree of freedom that you don't have. You assume that the end data points vary freely, but they are already used to estimate this beta hat ML. And therefore they are constrained, they're restricted. So you don't have that much information as you should be. So therefore, the second approach to address the bias issue, the second approach is to use not the profile likelihood, but, but the marginal likelihood. Okay, what does that mean? The marginal likelihood is that you want to integrate out beta from the likelihood. So basically, you're going to assume, okay, there are I want to consider all the possibilities of beta, or I want to take beta out by considering if all possibilities, so I'm only left with theta in my likelihood. Okay, so the second approach is called marginal likelihood of theta is we call this the ALM stands for marginal theta. So this is defined as the integral of the likelihood of beta and theta d beta. So you want to, basically this is just the sum, right? Integral is the continuous version of the sum. You sum up all the possible values of beta so that your likelihood does not include beta anymore. So to do that, we need to revisit this term. So what we have here for the likelihood of beta theta, let me just write it down. So essentially the first term, and this is proportional to, as we know, um, the this first term has nothing to do with beta, so I can get it out. So it's one over V theta one half. In the integral, it is exponential function of negative one half Y minus X beta transpose V theta inverse 
y minus x beta. Okay, d beta. That's right. So how do we do the integration for beta? Now we are going to use a very interesting technique to achieve this. So what we plan to do is that we hope to write this as some sort of a density function of beta by considering like beta is, the, is a multivariate random vector that follows a certain density. And then we're going to use that integration of the multivariate Gaussian density to get rid of beta. So that's the central idea. So if you recall that in this case, okay, in this formula, it is a multivariate density of y. If I do dy, what would I get? Given that normalization constant here and also the one I didn't write out about the pi, that term together, if I do integration of this density dy, I will get a value one as the integration result. That's just for the property of the density. And here we are exactly going to do this. So what we plan to do is to write it out as an integration for beta and this internal thing in the exponential term, we are going to write it as some um, density of beta. That's what we want to do. Okay, so for that density of beta, what will be the center of that density? What we want to use is the MLD of beta. So we want to convert this term as some density, make it become a density of this, of the normal with mean as beta hat MLD and some covariance we need to specify so that we can write this as beta following this. And then when we do d beta integration, beta is gone. So then we're only left with beta hat MLD. That's the central idea of this whole integration thing. And I think that's a, that uses a very important property of Gaussian. So you can always write this exponential term because it's an exponential inside of the power you have the, the square term. You can open up the square by writing it in another way. Okay, so just keep in mind that I'm going to post the lecture notes so you can see more of the details. So just to keep in mind that a nice property of Gaussian is that we can easily write out its normalization constant to achieve the integration. That is the integral of exponential negative one half y minus x beta transpose v theta inverse y minus x beta dy. Okay, here the, the, the random vector is y. It's just equal to two pi to the power of negative n over two times v theta determinant to the power one half, so the square root of the determinant. So this is what we know about integration. And let me see if I do have that, I should have the negative or not. Negative two pi to the power. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking whether I need a negative sign here or not. I don't think I, I don't think I need. Yeah, I think it should be plus. I think it's a type in the notes. So this is what we have for the normalization constant. Okay, so now what we plan to do is that we hope to write this form, this term as this. So we hope to write it as this exponential term as exponential of negative one half beta minus something transpose 
times some matrix in the middle times beta minus something. Okay, that's the first term I want to have. And then I want to see what's left there. And I know that the remaining term would also be an exponential term of one half of something, okay? So that's what I want to achieve. So essentially, so this is dy, okay? But sorry, I should say that it's just this term only for this part, not involving dy. Just for the exponential, I want to decompose it into two terms. And then it turns out that this remainder, so the first term, I want to have the center as beta hat MLE, which I can do. The second term, it turns out it just to be left with the terms of Y and V theta inverse and some other matrices. So ultimately, we are going to show that, um, so for the integration, we are going to, can, we can simplify it after we do this integration and do the cancellation with a normalization constant. So we are left with an additional term. That's very interesting. So just ignoring all the technical derivation, ultimately the marginal likelihood of theta, okay, is going to, theta is gone. And we can show that it is proportional to one over V theta one half, this constant stays. And we are going to still have this term out, but we are going to be having it as exponential negative one half Y minus X beta hat MLE, okay? transpose V theta inverse Y minus X beta hat MLD. That's the first term. In addition, we are going to have an exponential negative one half, and that would give me X transpose V Let me see. No, no, no. Sorry. No, just like that. It's just one inverse. Yeah. Um, X transpose V theta inverse X determinant one half. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so what I mean is that this term is the remainder that comes from this, okay? This gives me what's left here. I can write what's left here as this. And this term is the normalization constant from integrating beta. So integrating this part, d beta. Okay, this will give me that normalization constant. So yeah, so that's it. So essentially, what I'm going to have is just an additional term in my log likelihood. And that log likelihood then is just equal to, you see, this first term is just what? It's just equal to, so if I take the log, okay, taking the log, I'm going to have the log marginal likelihood of theta equal to, for the first two terms, I'm going to get the log likelihood of beta theta with beta plugging as the beta MLE. Theta, sorry, I forgot to say that this is a function of theta itself. Beta MLE theta and theta, that's the profile likelihood minus a term which is taking the log of this negative one half log of the determinant of X transpose V theta inverse X. That's it. So essentially the log marginal likelihood is equal to the log profile likelihood. 
minus a penalty. You can think of it in this way. Okay, so that's very interesting. So you see that these two things only differ by one term. And that word one term can be considered as a penalty for the, for the variance parameter. And that term only involves the fixed design matrix X. So you see how much do those two, um, if you want to maximize this log marginal likelihood to get your theta hat, versus if you just directly maximize your log profile likelihood to get your theta hat. The their difference will rely on this additional term. Okay, so I, I for this year, I didn't do this derivation in detail, but you can check the notes yourself. And I would say the key is just algebra. It's just you play with those matrices to make that this is becomes a density form of beta with a center as the beta hat MLE and then you calculate what's left there because this term no longer involved beta. So you put every term here involving beta into the first term. So with the integration, beta is gone, and then you are left with this. And we show that what's left here is just happened to be of this form. Okay, so with this, then you can define your theta hat R E M L as the maximizer of the marginal likelihood, not the profile likelihood. Essentially, what we said in that simple example by taking the differences between y2, y1, y3, y2 is also to get rid of the mean parameter. It's just that here we use a more systematic way of getting rid of beta and only have our likelihood left with theta called the marginal likelihood. Okay, so now you have the intuition and you have the definition of the restricted marginal likelihood. Okay, and so then the take home message is that if you are interested in the in estimating the variance terms using the theta hat, like the G, G theta, so you're going to have this, plug this in. So you're going to have G theta hat REML the, uh, the R matrix theta hat REML and the V theta hat REML. So you're going to have those and those can be used into the estimation of your beta hat, right? The beta hat, so finally the beta hat MLE, the beta hat MLE, is going to be rely on theta hat R E M L. So the take home message is that if you're interested in estimating the variance terms, you prefer to use the R E M L estimate because it is unbiased. That's the major reason. But as we will talk about in our next lecture, if you are interested in comparing models, like model comparison by testing whether you need to include some fixed effects then you must use the ML instead of REML. Because if you want to compare the beta, let's say beta one or beta two, just two models, one includes more fixed effects, one includes fewer fixed effects, then you need to compare the, the, the true likelihood that involves beta. And so in that case, when you do that likelihood ratio test under the two models, for the two models, for comparing the two models, that theta hat needs to come from the maximum likelihood, not the restricted maximum likelihood. Because in the restricted at maximum likelihood, there's no beta in the likelihood anymore. So you cannot do that. So we will talk about that in our next lecture. So we hopefully we can wrap up all our discussion about the tests and the parameter estimation about LMM in our next lecture. And also we can show you some interesting examples. And so in the last lec in the last lecture, which will be on next Thursday, what, what I plan to talk about is the model selection based on AIC and BIC and MALO-CP. So those kind of model selection criteria to wrap up our class. 
Okay, so for the remaining time of today, I invited my student Dong Yuan here to give you a short presentation about a model he used in his research. It's kind of related to what we have talked in this class, but it's actually an extension because here the features are engineered by some nonlinear transformation, and then you put them under a general linear model. Okay, so Dong Yuan, why don't, why don't you just start sharing your slide and, and start your presentation? Thank you. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Hello everyone, um, I'm Dong Yuan. I'm a second year bioinformatics PhD student from Professor Jessica Lee's lab. And today my topic is about generalized additive model. So this is a special case of generalized linear model, but not like generalized linear model, it can actually model the nonlinear trend. So I will show you what the model is and how to apply it on genomics data. So first let's Give me uh, give you some background about it. So in steps two five, we focus on linear model. So basically, after you use your link function, there's a linear relationship between your predictor and your outcome. But however, in reality, we often meet some linear nonlinear relationship between the covariates and the response. So here I show some examples in genomics. For example, here each dots represent one individual cell. Uh, and the X is the time covariate and the Y is the gene expression level. So as you can see for the gene CCL5, it shows very clear nonlinear increasing pattern with time. But for this gene ED, it does not show any pattern. So as you can see, we, here we have a nonlinear trajectory and how to fit it by a regression model is our question here. In order to introduce the generalized attitude model, we need to introduce the spline tool at the beginning. So spline is a very powerful tool for modeling nonlinear relationship. So if you remember, we are very lucky to invite um, Professor Wobas to give a talk in last quarter, and she is a pioneer uh, in developing the spline method. So basically, the uh, idea of smoothing spline is designed for balancing the goodness of fit uh, and the smoothness of the estimate function f hat x. So the problem is that if your f x hat is very flexible, then basically it can passes all the data points in your data set. But this model will be useless because, yeah, as you know, there's the um, variance bias trade off in machine learning. And if you use uh, function set, uh, which is very flexible, then actually you cannot extend it to new data. Therefore, we need to have a balance between the goodness fit and the smoothness. So the definition of a smoothing spline is like this. So here, xi and yi is a set of observation you have. And as in linear regression model, we assume that yi equals to the function of xi plus some random error. So the estimated uh, f hat is by minimizing this loss function. So you recognize the left part is just the least squares, but we have this extra penalty term. So it is lambda multiplies the integration of the square root of second derivative of the estimate function, where lambda is the smoothing parameter. So you can see this term is try to control the second derivative to make your uh, estimated function not too flexible. So here we have a question, what will you get if lambda approaches to zero? So as you can see, the answer is very obvious. So you will get an ordinary least square. <clears throat> That's the basic idea about spline. So here we come to our method. So a generalized attitude model, uh, which we call it GAM, is first proposed by Hasty and Tipshrani. So it is a generalized linear model with a linear predictor 
uh, including uh, some of smooth functions of covariance. So as you can see, if you just ignore this F1, F2, Fc, F3, et cetera, you just have a um, generalized linear model where your yi follows some exponential family distribution. But here for a GAN model, we actually have this nonlinear smooth function. So fg is a smooth function and it includes the queries xk. Um, but please notice that here we do not have interactions between different smooth function terms. So that's why we call this model generalized additive model, because between different smooth terms, it is still an additive relationship between them. So I will show you an example about how to use generalized additive model to analyze count genetics, uh, genomics data. So here for gene J, which comes from one to M, its expression level we denote it as YIJ. So this is your outcome. And we only focus on one gene J. So you can ignore the uh, J here in this uh, formula. And TI is a continuous time as our only covariate in the model. So here we use an active binomial generalized additive model, which we assume that marginally YIG follows the negative binomial distribution. So it is very similar to generalized linear model. Here we assume YIG follows negative binomial distribution and we use the log link function. But the difference is that here, besides the intercept term, we have a nonlinear smooth function for modeling the TI part. And here, this is a cubic spline function. And I notice that it uh, is a summation from one to K, which means that it's normal degree of freedom is K. So that's a basic idea about uh, NB GAM model. As we have learned in this 205 class, sometimes we may meet the zero inflation problem. And as we have learned in our class, we can use a hierarchical linear model to solve this. So here we define a zero inflated uh, negative binomial generalized editing model as like this. So ZIG is an indicator variable which follows Bernoulli PIG distribution. And if your YIG comes from ZIG equals to one, then it, is, it comes from a point mass zero. But if it comes from ZIG equals to zero, then it is uh, from a negative binomial distribution as we defined in our previous slide. And we still use the log link function. And here we need to consider how we want to model PIJ. So my assumption is that your dropout probability is a function of your underlying expectation of your gene expression level, which I think it is um, very reasonable because if you have higher expectation of gene expression level, then you should have um, um, lower dropout probability. And still the FJTI is a cubic spline function as we showed in our previous slides. So that's the basic idea about the nd gamma model and zero infinity nd gamma model. And we come to the hypothesis testing. So here our null hypothesis is actually very simple. We only assume that fj equals to zero. In other words, under the null, we think that we don't need to use a smooth function to model the relationship between uh, your query and outcome. And we denote the estimate of the vector fj across all different ti's by uh, both fj hat and it's estimated coherence matrix is um, VFG hat. So we have a world, a world test statistic here. And you can see basically it's just a um, square of FG hat divided by the variance of FG hat. But please note here, this is not the inverse of um, VFG hat because here we use um, <clears throat> R pseudo inverse of the Coherence matrix. So why do we want to use the pseudo inverse coherence matrix? This is because our coherence matrix is not in four rank. 
after you introduce some penalty term in your maximum likelihood function, uh, sorry, in your likelihood function, you actually decrease the effect of degree, effect degree of freedom of your model. So you can imagine that you introduce a very, very large penalty term. Then your model will actually become to uh, will actually become to a linear regression, right? So in such case, your degree of freedom is actually just one. So which means that your effect degree of freedom is usually not equal to your normal degree of freedom uh, since you use the penalty term in your likelihood. So therefore, we will use this R pseudo inverse, which is based on the largest R eigenvalues of your covariance matrix. So the asymptotic non-distribution of this is chi-square R if your R is an integer, but usually you are not so lucky because R is usually not an integer. So under that case, we will have a mixture of chi-square distribution. Um, but the theory behind this and the exact distribution is very complicated. So if you are interested in this, you can check Simon Wood's paper, um, biometric paper for more details. So finally, I want to show some codes about uh, fitting this uh, GAN model in R. So I think you should use the R package MGCV because it is the most powerful GAN implementation in R. And I think it is almost the default option for the R society. And after library your MGCV package, you can set a seed for, the, uh, for controlling the randomness and you use the uniform distribution to generate some random X. And here you can assume that your Y actually follows the sine function of X, which is a highly nonlinear and then you can construct your data frame. And eventually you use the GAN model, which is like this. So this is very similar to your GRM function in R, but here the formula is kind of different because you use this S uh, to include the X. So here S is the smooth function, which is supported by the MGCV uh, package itself. And I think the default function is just the cubic spline function, but of course there are some other choice you can use if you have some understanding about the underlying model. So as you can see, it's very simple and very convenient. And if you have learned GRM, then you should be um, very used to this form. And in the end, I want to share some extra materials about the GAN model. So I strongly recommend this book, Generalized Attitude Models, an uh, introduction with R by Simon Woods. Um, so Professor Simon Woods, um, he's also an editor of GRSSB journal, and he is also the author of R package MGCV. And most importantly, he proposed the most state-of-the-art series of GAN. So in his book, he has both the theory parts and also the codes. Uh, about how to use MGCV to analyze data. So I think this book is very comprehensive and you can find almost everything you want to learn about GAM model. And by the way, if you are interested in how to apply GAM model in genetics or genomics data, you can check my paper about applying GAM model on single cell genomics data. And my method is called uh, slow time D and I'm very happy to discuss this method or the general GAM theory if you are interested in this topic. Thanks, that's all my presentation today. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much for the introduction, Dongyuan. So yeah, as you can see that starting from linear model, we have so many generalizations, either on the distribution of the response or the relationship between the expected response and the predictors, our so-called systematic structure. So what Dongyuan just introduced is another generalization of the systematic structure. Basically, you can apply nonlinear transformation to your predictors before putting them into a linear additive way into your systematic structure. So 
that's why it's called a general additive model instead of general linear model, because in each component in your addition, it becomes nonlinear in terms of your original predictor. So lastly, I was want to show you something that's very well written. So to conclude today's lecture, just, just, just one quick screenshot. So you see, this is just, as I said, the website like towards data science, there's a very nice blog that explains the difference between maximum likelihood and restricted maximum likelihood, the topic of today's lecture. So I'm going to share this link on RCSLE as well as um, below our recording. So you can read those more carefully. So we have captured most of those in our lecture, but there is some data set and some R code for you to play with. So one thing I want to say is that if you take a look at our package for LMM, the M LME4 package, I would say from my perspective, the notation for the regression formula, it's not super intuitive if you are new to this. So please make sure that you really check the notation to see that you understand it. So essentially here, the IND is the group indicator or the factor that indicates the groups. And when you write it this way, essentially you're considering the random intercept model and the treatment is what you consider as the predictor whose fixed effect you are interested in. Yeah. So just please check out this blog after this class. And so we will continue to talk about like how to test for model parameters in the L in the LMM model, including the fixed effects and the random effect and how to do model comparison in our next lecture on next Tuesday. Okay, so that's all for today. Thank you everyone and see you next week. And please also check the presentation order for this class. Oh, so just, uh, have you sent the announcement for the new presentation time or not? Oh, also, I want to ask this question. So I've yeah. actually updated the announcement, but have you ever received any notice about it? If not, I will um, send a new announcement. Since yeah, I don't think I received it. Yeah. I only saw the previous one. Yeah, because okay. we have, I real, after Dongyan sent the first announcement saying that we'll have all the presentations on Thursday morning of week 10, I realized that we have some students in a different time zone. So that time will be difficult for us. So that's why we have several students who watch the video recording but not participate in the class live. So I think we'll, we're going to move our presentation to Friday afternoon at 3.30 p.m. if that works for everyone. So if that don't work for you, after you receive Dongyan's updated announcement, please let us know as soon as possible so that we can find a time that works for everyone. So did you say it's it's Friday? Yeah, Friday. Uh, okay. So then okay. I need to... The announcement right now is yeah. Thursday, Thursday nice. evening. Yeah, I need to yeah yes yeah, so it's, it's friday it will be we plan to have it on friday okay so that's all for today and thank you again Dong Yun, for giving us this guest tutorial thank you okay thank you everyone thank you. bye thank you bye